So we're lucky. Um, tonight, we're lucky enough to have Lynn Rosen. Lynn is going to talk about the bookstore perspective and what a writer should know about how a bookstore manager views books and selects them or works with authors. Um, she's going to talk about her own experience as a manager of both small and large bookstores and the insights that can empower you as an author. So I want to let you know that Lynn is now the store manager of Barnes & Noble in Wilmington, Delaware. Prior to that, she was the co-owner of Open Book Bookstore for five years, a small indie bookstore north of Philadelphia. It was a great place. I went there a couple times for presentations when they had authors come in and speak. Lynn's a longtime book publishing industry professional with many years of experience as an author, I'm sorry, as an editor, as a literary agent, and as a teacher. She's the author of Elements of the Table, a simple guide for hosts and guests. And Lynn graduated from the University of Pennsylvania with an honors degree in English, holds a master's degree in English and a comparative literature from Columbia University. She teaches writing and publishing classes at Open Book and has been a professor at Drexel University, Temple University, Rosemont College, and other academic institutions. Are we freaking lucky or what? You're embarrassing me. We are. So Lynn, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'm gonna turn the camera over to you. Gary, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, is my audio level okay? Great, and am I able to share screen? Okay, well. Let me make sure you can. Okay. Hi everybody, thank you so much for letting me be here tonight. I've really enjoyed listening to the last half hour and learning a very little bit about your work. Um, I'm just gonna jump right in. I have a little PowerPoint to share with you. And Gary, thank you for that nice introduction. Um, I think you should be good. Okay, let's try. Good? Yes. All right, so here goes. Um, and please, <laughs> You lost your mute. Sorry, that's my fault. I hit the wrong button. Oh. Okay, can Go you ahead. hear me now? Sorry. Okay, please interrupt with questions at any point. And Gary, please help me if I miss that someone, because I can't really see everybody with the PowerPoint on. I will help. Thank you. Um, so the... I'll talk a little bit more about my background as I go on. I've, I've had a long career in the publishing industry and I've really... I've never done anything else. I've never wanted to do anything else. I'm very grateful that I've had the opportunity to try out different parts of this industry. Um, and having done that, I have determined that being a bookseller is my favorite part. And as Gary said, I'm now at Barnes & Noble in Wilmington. So if you do want to make the drive to Wilmington, come visit me. I'm almost always there. Um, so Is that the books, one on 202? On 202, 4209 okay. Concord Pike. Yep, not in the mall anymore, a little south of the mall. So um, the bookstore is a very special environment. And here are some pictures I picked of different bookstores. And bookstores, as we know, can look lots of different ways. Um, but they obviously all have one thing in common. And as my uh, customers always come in and they want to they want help looking for something and they say, hi, I'm looking for a book. And I'm like, yeah, you came to the right place. <laughs> um, so I'm curious for, to hear from you for starters, what are some of the aspects of bookstores that you treasure the most? Anybody want to jump in? I love it when they have um, like the workers favorite books and the oh. little stickers on things like when you go to an independent bookstore especially cool yeah that's really important to me too really nice we have that we have a staff recommend i have to like tie my hands behind my back so that i don't take all the slots up myself right i like going to um i like going to small independent bookstores that are a hodgepodge of used books okay and when you walk in there the first thing that hits my senses is not only just the, the the comfort of the books stacked every which way but the smell there's a certain smell when you walk into a used bookstore um 
and uh, I don't know. I find that very comforting. I you can't get it in a new or a bookstore, whether it's a big one or an independent. It's you know, it's only in these these. Um, I don't even know how they exist anymore, but you know, just a used bookstore that has everything and anything you can think of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know exactly the smell you mean. Unfortunately, I'm allergic to it. <laughs> You're I allergic to, go, to it. I am. I don't. Of, I don't sell used books. Uh, part of it is mold, for sure. Part of it is mold. I'm allergic to mold. When I used, I used to go to, to the. Go, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Robert. Barnes and Noble in particular used to have shelves of um, specialty magazines, including literary journals. Mm -hmm. and I really used to like that because mm -hmm. it, it could introduce me without having to subscribe to them mm -hmm. to the writers that they found that they just found. Yep. And that was always always fun. But because, we still have that. Yeah, but it's diminished. It is. I mean, at some of the bigger stores, you'll find a bigger d d selection. They have a pretty big selection at um, Valley Forge, for example. Okay, I'll have to go there. Yeah. Sorry, I'm sending myself to a different store. There's oh, also good. a real pleasure in going to places like Whodunit that are so specialized. Mm -hmm. And you can come in and say, you know, I heard about this mystery. And you have only two or three words from it. And it's like going into a hardware store. They say, oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. That's kind of the magic of the bookstore, isn't it? And that's um, that's really the crux of it for me as well, that moment. Um, Gary talked a little bit about my background, but my work in trade publishing started at Random House um, where I was an editor and I had an experience there that I think led to me doing what I am today, which is I was, um, when I was first starting, I was a young editor and I was presenting my first book at this very large conference table with all these important people around it. And I did my nervous presentation. And then the sales manager looked at me from across the table and said, what shelf is it going to go on in the bookstore? Mm -hmm. And I did not have an answer for him. Um, but that really opened my eyes and got me many years later. Um, after I left Ballantyne, I opened my own literary agency and I was living in Park Slope in Brooklyn at the time when Barnes & Noble was just starting to open their superstores and they opened their first Brooklyn store in Park Slope, very close to where I was living. And I thought, well, I need to go find out what happens in a bookstore. Um, and so I went and got a part-time job there which led to my becoming the events manager there, um, which, you know, came back around years later and now I'm back with Barnes and Noble. Um, but that was the beginning of my understanding, or maybe it's, it's my personal belief that all the steps we take in creating books and bringing them to market, there's that final crucial step where a bookseller puts the book in someone's hand. Um, and to be able to do that is very exciting for me. So now I know what shelf things go on in the bookstores. Um, so that was my Barnes and Noble experience. And as Gary mentioned, um, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I have not been in any used bookstores, but I'm allergic to dust. Um, so, <clears throat> I started um, teaching a book discussion class and I still do. It's called Hot Off the Press. I teach it once a month. I've been doing it for 10 years. I recommend new literary fiction. At a certain point, I noticed that the people who were taking my class were buying the books that I recommended. And I thought, hmm, maybe I should be selling them. So I got a sales license and an account with Baker and Taylor. And I started selling books. And then my husband and I started doing pop-up bookstores. And then one day I said, guess what we're going to do? We're going to open a bookstore. And we opened Open Book in Elkins Park, um, which Evan still runs. It still exists, um, but I'm not associated with it anymore. And that was a really exciting opportunity to become part of the community in that way as a bookseller. 
And now, as I mentioned, I'm back with Barnes and Noble. And Barnes and Noble is in a really interesting place in the life of the business with the, um, I don't know how much you know about the new CEO, James Daunt, he ran Waterstones, he's British. And his goal is really to make Barnes and Noble more like an independent bookstore. And when um, Barnes and Noble was opening the superstores, um, they really were the enemy of the independent bookstore decades ago. They put a lot of indies out of business um, but that has changed. And I think really the Indies and Barnes and Noble are kind of in the same camp right now and rooting for each other. Barnes and Noble doesn't survive. That's not going to be good for independent bookstores. So we're all on the same team now, which is nice. Um, so I have another question for you. Do you like my cash register? Tell me where books get sold. Where do you buy books? Barnes and Noble. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and online. I mean, where in the bookstore? No, I mean, what 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 outlets sell books that you have? Amazon. Amazon, Amazon, yeah. Amazon, Amazon. Amazon. Or the library. Hmm. Oh, the library, book sales, nice. And there's um, there's a website um, called Book... Um, bookshop. Book, bookshop. Mm -hmm. um, I've been trying to use that. Mm -hmm. but, cool. Uh, yeah. Good, we'll talk about that. Where else? Independent Target. bookstores. So. Independent bookstores, Target. Conferences, writers' Airport. conferences. Mm -hmm. Anybody buy books in Costco? Oh, yeah. Costco is really important. That book buyer for Costco is a very respected person. Okay. Well, usually this is the elephant in the room. And um, you coming at this as an author and I coming at it as a bookseller will have very different <laughs> company. Um, I don't feel that this company is trying to do anything good for independent businesses. Um, so I no longer shop there, but we will leave that and we will move on to other outlets. And really tonight, my goal is to talk about um, the traditional bookstore. Um, I'm not going to really talk about the history of bookstores, um, except to you know, say that we owe it all to Gutenberg and that the printing press made books affordable and accessible to the masses. And since then, merchants have been thinking of countless ways to sell them. In terms of um, bricks and mortar bookstores in the US, what exists is mostly um, the independent bookstores and the chains, but the chains are diminished as well. The chains that we once knew like B. Dalton and Walden Books and Borders have disappeared for different reasons. Some due to shrinking market, some due to financial mismanagement. Um, and the biggest chain, book chain right now is Barnes and Noble. It was founded in 1873 when Charles M. Barnes started a business in his Illinois home. Nearly a century later, Len Riggio acquired the flagship Barnes & Noble trade name and over the next four decades really transformed it into a bookselling giant. And then it was purchased by a holding company and James Daunt was brought in about two years ago to be the new CEO. Um, a major Barnes & Noble innovation, as I have already mentioned, is the Superstore. Um, I'm sure you have all had the experience of sitting in the comfy chairs, mm -hmm. um, which we don't have anymore right now. And the whole idea of bookstores having cafes, I think Barnes & Noble was an innovator in that. And in some aspects that worked and in some it doesn't. Um, you know, I know people who go sit in Barnes & Noble for hours and just re read all they want and don't buy anything. So mm -hmm. in some ways it works against them. Um, and Barnes & Noble is, is struggling in different ways. Obviously COVID, has taken a huge hit on independent bookstores, but they're trying to make a go of it. Um, Pre-COVID, there was a lot of growth in independent bookstore um, in membership of the American Booksellers Association, which is the trade association of independent bookstores. Um, and things really were strong and getting stronger, um, but they have taken a big hit and there's a lot of suffering. So that's a sort of quick overview of the world of bookstores in the United States. And now I'd like to turn to your point of view as authors and what it is maybe you see or you need to know when you look at a bookstore or approach a bookstore. Um, so you have certain goals as an author. Um, I could simplify those to say you want to be published and you want to see your work for sale in a bookstore. Is that right? 
Yes. And you want to be found and noticed by your readers, which is not an easy thing. That was one of the first things I noticed when I started working in Barnes and Noble and the big Barnes and Nobles that could be 30 or 40,000 foot square square foot stores, um, as opposed to my little open book, which was about 500 square feet. And the first thing I thought when I started working there was how does any one individual book ever get noticed? You know, when you think that most of them are spine out and hard to find and then add other complications, like they maybe get shelved in the wrong area. So it's really hard. And I want to share maybe a little bit about what might help you figure out um, how to get your books into a bookstore and um, how to get noticed by readers. So I'm gonna talk a lot now about more about the, the work that I did in an independent bookstore um, because in the independent bookstore, I was the buyer. In Barnes and Noble, while there is more buying power going to the individual stores, a lot of it is managed by corporate buyers, um, centrally managed. So there we were. Um, I did this for about five years. We were located in a very small town center. Um, and here are some of the many hats that I wore as an owner of an independent bookstore. Okay, that's what the outside of the store looked like in our cute little downtown Elkins Park. Um, so one of my big jobs was being the buyer. And I had to choose the categories that we carried. Um, a big bookstore like Barnes and Noble will really try to carry at least some of everything. And we could not do that. And there are categories where we had to make a conscious decision to say, that's just not something that we can have because we don't have the space. Um, and maybe we don't have the customers. Um, for example, graphic novels. Graphic novels, we just had very few of them. People were not buying them. Um, there were things that we tried. We did an event once with the poet Sonia Sanchez. And she said, the reason people don't buy enough poetry is because bookstores don't display it. And if all the bookstores put tables in the front of the store with poetry on them, then people would buy more poetry. And so I tried it and it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so our poetry section got bigger and then it got smaller again. Uh, but this is the sort of thing that I have to balance. And most bookstores will have a specialty. Um, our specialty was literary fiction because that's a particular interest of mine. It was children's picture books. Um, those were two areas that we were really strong in. Um, my current store, my Barnes and Noble in Wilmington were really strong in fiction and mystery and history and manga. It's just two shops there and what we do well. So buying is a really huge job. It involves networking with lots and lots of publishers, also with distributors. That's something we can talk about if you want, ask me about that later. Um, lots of ways that I found out about books, reading Publishers Weekly, looking at this online catalog called Edelweiss, which you might be able to sign up for. Um, possibly you could sign up as a book reviewer um, and, and there are all these electronic catalogs on there. Um, I would go to conferences, book expo, my regional book association. And then I'm sure you all know about advanced reader copies, right? So this is a big way that publishers are trying to promote their titles by getting early copies into the hands of booksellers and reviewers to try to get attention. So that's just a quick overview of what I did as a book buyer, very time consuming. And then of course the books arrive in the store, they have to be received, they have to be shelved, they have to be merchandised, and then they have to be sold. So book selling is my next um, part of my job. You know who this is? Just from there. That is one of my book selling heroes. That's Ann Patchett. Huh. Ann Patchett is an author and also a bookseller. There she is in Parnassus Books in Nashville, which is her store. And um, book selling is Book selling is getting to know your customers. Book selling is getting us is engaging with them, talk, finding out what they like to read. Um, you know, I talk to everybody who comes into my store. You're not going to be able to avoid me if you come in my store. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to talk to me and tell me what you like to read. And then I would like to bring your attention to something that you wouldn't have found without me. Um, and that's what's called hand selling. And that's what good booksellers do well. 
Um, another big part of my job and any bookstore owner's job is events. So these are some pictures from some of the events we had. Children's event up on the top, um, down at the bottom, there's, um, that's Madeline Miller who wrote Circe and the Song of Achilles. There are some great children's book authors down there. I don't know if you can see Nick Foles. We didn't actually do an event with him, but we did with Ray Didinger and we had the Eagles cheerleaders at our event. <laughs> so um, events are a really big thing that you can get involved in. This is Erica Armstrong Dunbar. Um, she is an, uh, an historian. Um, she wrote a book about um, George Washington's escape slave never caught that was a National Book Award nominee. And, um, you know, we really need to understand who, who's gonna come to our events um, and what kind of books we wanna have in the store that, that will, people will come. Cause we certainly don't wanna have an author and then not be able to provide an audience. So um, these are just some quick tips that I can offer to you if you want to pitch a bookstore uh, to do an event with you for your book, um, the first thing you need to do is get to know as much as possible about the bookstore. Um, look at their website, get on their mailing list and visit if you can. Social media is really important. So you should follow them on social media. You could you should read any press that they have. You really should do everything you can. I mean, I, just as an example, I remember one author contacted me and he, he called me and he said, I'm a local author. I live in Elkins Park. You should, you should carry my book. I live half an hour from, uh, I'm sorry, half a mile from your store. And I didn't recognize his name. And I said, I, I don't, I don't think I know you. Have you ever been in my store? And he said, no. And I said, bye-bye. Um, so come in. The opposite example is um, an, Dana Bate, an author we did an event with. I will never forget the day she walked into my bookstore. It was like four o'clock in the afternoon. And, and I'm sure that she knew that that was a good time to come because it was a very quiet time and I was not busy. And she walked in with a big smile on her face and she said, hi, I'm a local author and I have a new book coming out and I brought you a copy. And it was just the best introduction ever. And we went on to do an event with her and we had about 70 people come and we'd sold tons of books. Um, that was one of my favorite events because the book took place in London and it was about a food writer. We decided to have a scone baking contest and we had some English and chef judges and it was huge and it was fabulous except scones make a lot of crumbs. So I won't do that again. <laughs> um, if you don't know where to start, start nearby. Start with your closest bookstore and develop a relationship with them and then go from there, you know, learn the ropes. But the bookstore is going to expect you to be a partner. You never want to say, um, you know, here's my book. It'll be really good for your store. You do all the work. The bookstore wants to do the work with you in terms of promoting the event. Um, this is Christine Everly. She's an Elkins Park author. Um, she wrote a religious book. She developed a great relationship with us. We had her launch party. Have you ever heard of her? No, you have not heard of her. We sold 90 copies of her book at the launch party. It's probably the most we ever sold because she worked it and she invited all her friends and it was a really big deal. This is, she put our bookstore on her website. Um, she promoted that. This is what the page looked like, Finding God in Ordinary Time. Very small publisher, very niche audience, beautiful book. And she was just a joy to work with. Um, we've done this with more prominent authors as well. Here's Lori Holtz Anderson. Um, Lori has open book on her website right there as the store to go to if you need signed copies because she lived nearby. We were her neighborhood bookstore. Again, there she is selling her books. Um, so this is a relationship that really worked. So anybody anywhere in the country who wanted an autographed copy of Lori's books 
bought them from us and then Lori would come by and sign them. Um, so can I, a, can I ask a question, Lynn? Please. My sister did a book signing in Philadelphia at the Barnes & Noble in Philadelphia, and it was not really successful. And one of the things that the store manager had told her was that um, these events, these book signings are mostly author, um, like what's the phrase they used? Um, I, I'm not gonna get the phrase, but, but the, they sold on average less than 20 books for any author that would come in for a book signing. Vanity, it was author vanity. Oh. So do you have a contrasting opinion to that or what? what because clearly you've gotten some much better results than that. Is it, and, and I'm sure part of it's because, hey, my sister had four of her friends come, right? That was it. That's all my sister generated for her you know, book. And it's not it, fair to expect the store to do everything. No, I mean, you want to each party to be doing equal parts of the work in terms of promoting it. I mean, we right. have a mailing list of 2000 names, you know, we're promoting pretty widely, um, but I want the author to have names as well. I I'm, wouldn't do an event if I thought that the only people who were gonna come were the author's four mm -hmm. friends. Now, but that like, so if I'm doing an event for a small book, like I did for one woman who lived in the neighborhood and had self-published a collection of her short stories. And I insisted that I wanted the launch party, mm -hmm. okay? So if I'm having the very right. first event for this book, then all of her friends and family are gonna come. Right. Um, and those are great events. Those are successful and those sell lots and lots of copies and everybody, you know, people buy four copies because they give them to all their friends right. as presents. Um, so, you know, it, it, it falls on me a lot to try to make the decision. Mm -hmm. Do I think I can bring out an audience? Because there's nothing more mortifying than throwing a party and nobody comes. Right. And I don't want to do that to you and you don't want that to happen. Right. So we have to really know that the audience can come. Right. So we start with, well, I know my, you know, at Open Book, I knew what my people would come for. They would come for literary fiction. They would come for um, personal growth. They would come for writing books. You know, I, I knew who was in the audience. Um, and sometimes we had some big name people. We had Matthew Quick. Um, you know, we had, we had Lori Holtz Anderson. We packed him in, you know. Um, we had Irene Levy Baker, who wrote 100 Things to Do in Philadelphia Before You Die. And every single member of our synagogue came to that event. <laughs> you know, it do, you don't have to be famous, but you do have to have connections. Does that answer the question? It, it does, right? I, it does. Yeah. Ask a practical yes. follow-on question. Are, are these consignment agreements typically? Most of the time, no. So if... I would prefer to, to buy the books myself and, and they're returnable, but um, if it, it's a self-published book and I'm working with a local author, then yes, it will be a consignment. And if your book is not available through Ingram, then it will be a consignment. So for example, there was a local author who decided to self-publish her book on CreateSpace and I said, well, I'll do an event with you and I'll buy the books from you, but you're not gonna get an event with any other independent bookstore in the country because no independent bookstore is gonna buy books from Amazon. So. Forgive me, what do you mean by Ingr Ingram? Ingram is a book distributor, wholesaler. So I have, um, again, I'm talking in the present tense, but I mean at open book, okay? So I have accounts with all of the major publishers um, and a lot of small publishers and I buy directly from them. I get a better discount when I buy directly from them. But if it's a small publisher I don't have an account with 
or I need books quickly, or maybe I, you know, a publisher has a minimum, so I only need a few books, so I want to consolidate. Then I want to buy them from a wholesaler, and a wholesaler will have every book in their warehouse, and then I can pick and choose from different publishers for my order. So there were two major wholesalers, Baker and Taylor and Ingram, but Baker and Taylor closed their trade business. They now just work with schools and, and libraries. So Ingram is really the only, there are other distributors, Bookazine and others, but Ingram is the biggest one. Um, so if you publish, if you were to self-publish, you would want to try to make your book distributed by Ingram. Is if Ingram you, uh, print on demand? If you do print on demand, you can still be distributed by Ingram, if, particularly if you're printed by Ingram Spark, which is their print on demand division, which I think is a pretty good company. Um, I, I don't know that Ingram will distribute you if you're published by CreateSpace. You know, and you, you are gonna know the advantages of selling on Amazon already. Um, but from my point of view, they're, they're liabilities. They make it harder for me to sell your book. And that's my point of view as an indie and as Barnes and Noble. Could I ask a question? Are you, is this a good time for a question? Yeah, absolutely, Mike. Okay. I'm very interested in genres. Uh, I, I've been looking for lists of genres to, you know, how do you, how do you, uh, can, first off, is there a central processing place where everyone knows that all of the genres are there? I found the back of writers uh, uh, has like a hundred subject areas in quotes. Right. Right. So uh, uh, I'm dealing with a uh, self-help book basically. Right. Mm -hmm. How do I then connect that to publishers? Is there a, a central place where I could find a list of publishers and, and the, the, uh, um, the genres that they published, uh, that they sell, like your store has uh, four literary fiction and whatever. Do you want a list of publishers or bookstores? I want a list of bookstores that might be interested in selling my self-education book. No. But you, can, you can't match up a genre next to a bookstore? No. Or, no. No, but I think you, it's a, did you say self-education? Right, self-help. Self-help. Or, or, or education, sells, yeah. Everybody sells self-help. They call it different things, personal growth, personal development. I mean, my bookstore was really tiny, so we had to specialize. Most bookstores oh, try to- uh, I'm sorry. Is How about the matching up the genre to publishers? Is there a matchup that way? Well- I mean, if, if, you know, we're really talking very generally for if you were gonna do religion, how would you find the set of religion publishers? Um, I think you could look in literary marketplace. I think that still exists where all the publishers are listed with their, with their categories. That's, that's what I'm asking. That's, that's perfect. Thank you. Literary marketplace. Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. yep. Great. Okay. I'm going to keep going, but tell me if you have more questions. Um, I just put this letter in because this is a, a real letter that I got that I thought was a really nice example. Um, this is somebody who understood what I was looking for and made it really clear. Um, and, and that's what I want you to do before you approach a bookstore is understand what they want to hear. Okay, They want to hear that you understand the business, you understand how it works, that you know where your book is distributed and where they can get it and that you're gonna partner with them in any way you can. You have a mailing list, you have family in the area, you have, you belong to the XYZ Association and you're gonna promote it there. You have a social media platform. Um, in terms of how you approach, um, I, I, you can, I guess whatever's comfortable for you. I don't like a phone call to be the first step. I want to see something in writing. Give me a chance to evaluate on my own um, without you sort of standing there watching me to see if I think it's something that right that's right. If you send an email, chances are I'm going to be really slow answering. And if you want to follow up with a phone call and say, oh, just checking to see if you got my email, you know, don't ever try to guilt me out though. Don't say, I sent you an email two weeks ago and you didn't respond. I, I won't take that well to that. Um, but this is just sort of an example of like a week's worth of mail 
from authors. Um, so it's kind of overwhelming what we receive. This is at your open book store? This was from open book, yeah. Oh, one week. Yeah, pretty much. Now this one, um, I hope this isn't anybody you know, but I picked this out as a promotion that really got under my skin. Somebody just gave me this and I'm, I don't know. I mean, it looks hand-drawn, but, um, but this was the inside. And um, this is something you give to an independent bookstore. Oh, yeah. So, right, I can't tell you how many people would write to me and say, um, I'd like you to carry my book and for more information, here's a link and give me a link to Amazon. It's like, do you not understand? Amazon is, the, is my enemy. Don't tell me to go to Amazon for information. So this is um, Jane Finkel. This is her website. And we also sold her book. She was a local author. You know, what she did down there is nice. Um, I would have preferred that Indie Bound was first. Um, but she's listing everything. So, so I just want to be clear. I'm not saying don't sell your book on Amazon. I'm saying just, you know, here are the th three main um, areas where people can find the book. So that's nice. This is bookshop.org, which I, Leslie, I think you were the one who mentioned that. So bookshop.org is another alternative for indie publishers. Um, and you can go on and create your own bookstore there. It's, it's, it's available to everyone. I created a little, this is my, just my Lynn reads a book thing. And I, I put some books up there. It's easy to do. You could do it. Um, but IndieBound was the American booksellers online platform to try to promote um, indie book selling. Okay. And then we talked a little bit about this, but um, you really have to plan in advance to get an event on the calendar. Now, of course, you know, this, I'm talking about normal times. Um, right now, people are doing Zoom events. You know, Reads and Company is uh, an independent bookstore in Phoenixville. They do great events. They are so successful with their virtual events. Check out what they're doing. They, um, that's a good example. So you can, you can do the same for virtual events and see what stores are doing. And that was just a quick, um, if you want to find this article, what is it, January 2018? Um, I wrote this article about how to pitch yourself to bookstores. So there's more detail. Um, if you read Poets and Writers, if you can find that. And um, I interviewed a bunch of other booksellers for their take on what works and how they like to be approached by authors. So that is the end of my PowerPoint. I'm all yours. Ask me more questions. Oh, I'm curious, Lynn. Um having read a little bit of your biography, um, why, uh, what was your experience teaching the writing and why you didn't stay in academia? Have you ever worked for a Catholic college? No, and I will never work for a Catholic college. They don't pay very well. So. I, I love teaching. I love it. I would love to go back to it. I, you know, I keep my hand in with my monthly book discussion class and um, I'll hopefully add more classes again. I just, you know, with a new full-time job, it's a lot for me. Um, my year, my three years at Rosemont were fabulous, you know, with the, the publishing program. I really enjoyed it. Um, it's great. And all the other places I taught, um, Drexel, I started teaching at Drexel when they had a graduate publishing program, but they've since closed down that program. Mm. Um, but Kit, a Kit asks, how does Kindle affect book selling? And I'm guessing from your perspective. Well, when e-readers were created, everyone predicted the death of print. That is not the case. In fact, um, this is Publishers Weekly from this week. Print unit sales up 21.3% in mid-February. Print is strong. People are still reading print. P 
people do like there. I mean, people who like e-readers like e-readers. I understand the convenience of the Kindle. Um, Barnes and Noble didn't do a good job bringing the Nook in. You know, Kindle took over the market. Amazon doesn't play nicely with others. The Kindle format is proprietary. So if you buy a Kindle ebook, you can't read it on any other reader. Um, Barnes & Noble, by the way, next week is introducing a new Nook tablet. So they're still committed to e-readers. Um, so, um, and e-readers are popular for people who travel, for people who like to read at night if they have somebody else in bed and they, they want that backlit reader so they don't have to turn the light on and disturb somebody. And um, people, older people like it because you can make the font as big as you want. But wait, Gary, I lost the focus of the question. No, no, you, you're doing great. You just, it was just a general question. So you're doing wonderfully. Yeah, I mean, the whole, the, the, stru the royalty structure with eBooks is different. Um, and they're, they're just not as big a market share as people, people predicted, but, but they're still there. They're still a significant part of the market. Um, I'm, I'm old fashioned, I read print. Leslie, it's Walter. I'd like to take you back to um, when you were talking about being a buyer as part of what you had to do running mm -hmm. a bookstore. Mm -hmm. um, people talk a lot about curation. Mm -hmm. And I, I certainly understand that in terms of something like a gallery. Um, and I also understand what it isn't when it's just a, a, a bot providing me with tunes that it thinks I will like. But how does it apply specifically to, to book selling? So Do you see yourself as a curator? Yeah. I mean, there was a while where curation was like an overused word. But um, there was. I, I do see myself as a curator. Um, so, so I what I do is very, I think, very different and much better than an, an algorithm on Amazon, which will say if you like this, then you might also like that. So, curation works in a couple of different ways. Um, I'll tell you a story. There was a um, there's a very famous independent bookstore in Denver called the Tattered Cover. And the woman who founded it sold it to another guy, um, Len Vlahos, who uh, ran it with his wife and did an event. This was pre-COVID, but shortly before COVID, did an event with Ted Nugent, mm. who is a gun-toting right-wing, I don't know a lot about him, um, and people protested, how, how dare you host Ted Nugent? And they came out with a statement that said, we don't make judgments. Anybody who has a book, we're willing to host them. Well, that was the biggest mistake they ever made. Mm. Okay? Mm. And the result was two months ago, they had to sell the business because they just, they lost it. Okay. So I say that in response to the question about curation, because I think every bookseller makes decisions about what they want to sell and I want you to walk into my store and I want you to see that my store has a personality. So there were things that I chose to do and that I chose to sell and that I chose not to sell. I didn't sell blatant anti-Trump books because I didn't want to get people talking, getting upset about politics in my store. I didn't sell any of those books that are so popular now that are like F star CK in the title. You know, I didn't sell um, best, some big bestsellers, right? Like if you wanted the new Nora Roberts or the new James Patterson, it wasn't at my store because you could get it for 40% off at Costco. So what did you need me for? What you needed me for was to walk in the store and to find something that you never heard of, okay? Go do a survey and see how many people in Elkins Park are reading A.M. Holmes and have read every single book of hers. Did you ever hear of her? She's amazing, okay? If I can introduce you to a writer you never heard of, that's my job as a curator is to make it interesting and to give it a personality and a vibe. There's a, a, an independent bookstore 
um, in Narberth. Um, yes. I think it's just the Narberth bookstore. And yes. it's got a, an incredibly small um, foot space. And yet they curate it just beautifully. Yes. Um, and so I, I, every place I go, when I go visiting, when I, when I used to travel, I'd make sure I find an independent bookstore. And I, I give myself one book. I can buy one book at a time. So that way I can keep going back to all sorts of different That's a beautiful things. thing, Leslie. Thank you for that. And Ellen's bookstore in Narberth is a beautiful store. She decorated it so nicely. I yeah. love it. I love her yeah. store. Support her. She she needs it. Yeah, I go to her and I go to Wellington in um Yeah, he's yeah. he's a character. He is. He is. Um but when I go to to different independent bookstores, um I ask, do you have a shelf for local authors? Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I'm surprised when I go visiting places, especially independent bookstores, when they don't have it. And I don't believe, or at least it didn't, the last time I looked, Barnes and Noble, my my little one in Broomall, or you know the big one in Conshohocken. Um, I don't think they have a shelf for independent. I'm sorry for for local um, authors. They have local local themed books like you know the history of you know your little town or you know rails to trails in your area but local authors i don't believe i have seen i think you're right i'm not remembering that valley forge has a local author section i assume that's the one you mean the one in devon the one on oh no i was thinking about the one in conshohocken this one in conshohocken there's a big one in conshohocken plus meeting Noble? Yeah, Barnes and Noble, Plymouth, oh, Plymouth Meeting. Meeting. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, those two. Yeah, there's a okay. smaller, the smaller I one in Devon. I don't know that's right. We have a local, a local yeah. author slash local interest section. Well, actually, it's a table. It's a big table, and it's right in the front of the store. And it's not only Joe Biden books. <laughs> Philadelphia, Barnes and Noble. Yeah. Had the same. Yeah, yeah. I haven't been there in too so long. But. many great Philadelphia authors. I mean, Madeline Miller's local, um, uh, Liz Moore, Kylie Reed, a lot of re recent bestsellers. They're local. I'm proud of them. Claire, um, I forget her name. Anyway, I could go on and on. I, I, I mean, I know most of these people. So. Is it up to the Barnes & Noble manager to include that local author's um, section? Yeah, and we have we have a lot of um, freedom to do whatever kind of specialized displays we want. Okay, good. Yeah, good. and that's something that's very important to me. So, Lynn, uh, just before I lose this thread, um, you know, going back to the story of the independent bookstore who who did not uh, or who tried to sell Ted Nugent's book, or he was coming there, right? Mm -hmm. It was okay, he did, so, did an event. Yeah, so. Based on based on that, I'm thinking, um, would would you or would Barnes and Noble as as a corporate, what would you do with that decision? If Ted Nugent wanted to come to the bookstore and have a, you know, whatever what whatever book he's touting, mm -hmm. um, would you accept him? Because obviously Barnes and Noble is not an independent bookstore. So. So the decision, this is a slight spin on the decision, but I think it's significant. My decision is the people who shop in my store aren't going to buy that book. Therefore, they're not going to come to my event. How you do you have sole control over that? Because Ted Nugent or somebody in his size yeah. of stardom is going to have a lot of power over the corporate well, not over it, but they're going to have some influence. Right? Well, so in, in Barnes and Noble, I don't have that power. Corporate decides who goes to which store. But at Open Book, I do have that power. And it works a number of ways. I develop relationships with publicists from all the publishers and I, and I court authors, okay? And sometimes I see that a book is coming out on Edelweiss or at Book Expo and I, you know, I chase after the publicist, please, 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 can I have that author? More frequently, the way it works now is that the publishers put out, um, all, they call them author grids on Edelweiss that basically says, these are all the authors we're touring in this upcoming season. 
write us a proposal. And we have to write a proposal for each one to do, um, to tell them what we would do, how we would promote it, how many people we think we could get to come, how many copies of the book we think we could sell. Um, so I had some success with that. I mean, I did an event with Ann Patchett. We had 300 people. We did an oh. event with Amor Tolls. We had 500 people. We did an event with Danny Shapiro. I don't know if you know her. She's wonderful. Her most recent book was called Inheritance. You memoir writers might want to check it out. It's a beautifully written book. Um, we had about 250 people. We didn't do those events in the bookstore. We did them at my synagogue because they let us use their sanctuary, which seats 800. Um, so I probably, so I don't get any, I wouldn't get anything forced on me. I just wouldn't bid on it. I wouldn't put a proposal in for Ted Nugent because I, I don't think I could fill a room. Um, you know, I tried to go after things that I thought people would like. Sonia Sanchez, Ray Didinger, you know, Ann Patchett. Those, those are authors I knew I could fill a room. The most controversial book I think I did was a novel by a Palestinian author. Um, and it was fine, it was lovely. Her book was terrific and we had a great event. I'm curious to know, um, maybe not from your side, but maybe from the corporate side, because of the flurry of political books in the past four years. I mean, yeah. it's just been a fire hose. Yeah. Um, and uh, obviously when an author who has written a political book, and it doesn't matter from which side, um, would come and, and give, you know, a, a, a presentation on the book, right? Mm -hmm. It's a political event. It's viewed as a political event more than it is viewed as an author event, in a way, uh, yeah. by the people, right? Do, especially, yeah. you know, the more controversial the, the, the person yeah. who wrote the book, the more. So how does, how does uh, Barnes & Noble handle something like that? Or how do you handle it? Um, I think that Barnes and Noble is interested in events that will bring in big crowds and sell lots of books. And if it's somebody they think is controversial, they'll handle it more delicately. They'll have security. I mean, my store did an event with Joe Biden, not in my time, but before I got there. And, you know, They'll be careful. They'll manage it carefully. Valley Forge had Nick Foles. They had 500 people waiting in line. You know. Um, yeah, but both of those people are are very, uh, you know, um, likable around this area. Right? Well, I, I think that Barnes and Noble would make decisions to send the authors to stores where they would be welcome. And it's it's not the sort of um, event that I was ever comfortable doing. I didn't want to do anything that could potentially be controversial. That made me uncomfortable and it made me feel unsafe. So I didn't do it. The other thing is if you're planning, if you're a bookstore in Philadelphia, you, you only get second choice after they pitch the free library. So right. somebody of that level is going to go to the free library. The They're free not library first. Okay. That makes sense. I've seen a lot of authors at the free. Yeah, that's a very prestigious series. So. Yeah. Yeah. I hope it comes back. Oh, they're doing virtual events, lovely events. I think, I mean, I encourage you all to sign up for their mailing list and go to their events. Many of them are free. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Any other questions? This is your chance, folks. You're talking to someone who is right in the center of everything. Wait, Leslie, you're on silent. Maybe on purpose, but you know, um, I'm writing a book too. Oh, tell us. Well, I published a book uh, with Clarkson Potter in, in, a long time ago now, 2007. You mentioned it, my elements of the table, but I decided that my life would not be complete if I didn't try to write a novel. Um, okay. And I have a first draft finished and damn it, I really need to just finish it. As, as do we all. You can join our group, you know. Any, any critique. I, I, well, when <laughs> I was, we would support you, yeah. 
When I was listening to you, I, I considered it. I actually have a wonderful writer's group that I started at the bookstore six years ago. We've been meeting every other week for six years. I'm so proud of us. It's small. There's 12 of us. And I, I love these people. They're like my family now. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So I don't know. Send me an email in August and say, did you finish the damn thing yet? You're not getting any younger. <laughs> okay, folks, this is your job to hold her accountable. Right, I have where always... we can offer value back. What's the genre? What's it about? Uh, it's literary fiction, and it's about a woman who wants to write a novel and is struggling. <laughs> <laughs> what you know? Where did you get that idea? Yeah, <laughs> my goodness. No. I mean, I hope it's literary fiction. We'll see. You can no, you can have her in a whole group of people who are struggling to write a novel. Exactly. There's it's, a whole it's interesting a thing novel. here, right? Because we all hear about the fact that in order to get a publisher or an agent, they want to see that you've built your audience. They want to see that you've built your platform. You uniquely have built your platform of readers all in, in a very different way than the average writer can. Right? I guess. I guess. I guess. I mean, my platform is people who want information about publishing and I mean, my, I've had different platforms along the way. Like when I taught publishing, it was people who wanted to work in the publishing industry. Mm -hmm. Like at Rosemont, that was the constituency. When I taught writing, it was writers. And now it's mostly readers. It's people who come to me for book recommendations. Right. Uh, Goodreads is owned by Amazon. Hmm. I'm sorry? Kit just asked me about Goodreads. Oh, it's owned by Amazon. So I wanted to ask you for someone who is considering opening a small independent bookstore. Would you recommend it? And if you would, what would be the, the most important criteria for being able to curate a, an interesting successful independent bookstore? Well, in terms of being able to curate it, I had worked in the publishing industry for 20 years before I opened my store. So I felt like I knew, I knew what I wanted. Like I, I didn't, like Baker and Taylor used to provide a service for new bookstores where they would help you build your initial opening collection. Mm -hmm. I didn't need that. I knew what I wanted. Um, if you want to open a bookstore, I mean, you're not going to make any money. Um, look at my friend, Joelle Herr, who owns a store called The Bookshop in Nashville. Follow her on social media. She came to me one day and said, I'm thinking of opening a bookstore. And I said, you're crazy. Don't do it. And she ignored me and she did it. And she has a beautiful little store. She works nonstop. She's exhausted. She's up against Ann Patchett because if you go to Nashville and you want to go shopping, you're going to go to Parnassus. You're not going to go to the bookshop. But check her out. It's, I think she's really done it right. So is Ellen in, um, in Narberth. You know, she created a beautiful environment. She curates carefully. Her, her niche was design books. So she has a lot of beautifully illustrated art books, um, which is not something that I carried. What was the name of the one in Nashville? Not Ann Patchett's, the other one. The Bookshop. Oh. Yeah, let me, I'll, I'll find her for you. Okay. I mean, I don't want to say don't do it. It's, um, you know, I had this, guy he was a poet he was a little bit supercilious and he used to come into my store a lot he came <laughs> in one day he hadn't been there in a while and he saw that the store had expanded and he looked around at all my books and he said oh it's a really nice hobby you have here oh yeah. oh and um did you, call the, did you call the police on him you know i hate to say it but he wasn't all wrong. Like 
I, I feel like I did a, that was my civic duty. I did community service for Elkins Park. I provided them with the bookstore. And now I work for, for Barnes and Noble and I have a paycheck and health insurance. <laughs> so you Can may I come in at, at a weird angle? Um, <laughs> sure. I've been doing it all night, but we've been talking about publishing, you know, writing, um, and book selling. So do you have, I mean, City Lights is one of the places that it just has a place in my heart. It's unique. Do you have any thoughts about? About City Lights? Yeah. City Lights is, is an institution. City Lights is like, yeah, it should be like protected it should be an American institution. It's an amazing source. So, and Lawrence Ferlinghetti just died, right? Was he 101? Yeah, yeah. Just, just a short time ago, yes. Yeah, I have spent a lot of time in City Lights. They also have a publishing arm, which is really cool. Right. I mean, City Lights is like a part of history and they have a very distinct personality and focus and bent. You know what they're about. I love City Lights. So I've only been in that one. Um, with, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, it was going along with what I was remarking upon what you said about, you know, your competition when you're starting an independent bookstore and you've mm -hmm. got to look around for the competition because uh it, it reminds me well everything reminds me of um of this conversation i used to live in portland oregon and um in where portland portland oh. so powell's oh yes. powell's is an institution there right. and if you're gonna open up an independent bookstore in portland you can't ignore powell's right yeah. I, people would come and visit me from out of state and that would be one of the places I would take them yeah. on a tour of Portland with like we got to go to Powell's yeah. it's so awesome I love Powell's anyway um, to switch gears for a minute on your your publishing experience um, there's a there's a there's a few people in um, in this group um, and a couple other groups that I'm I'm with that are writing memoir mm -hmm. so I'm wondering from your from your Public publishing experience, as well as you know, being a bookseller, um, we know that it's you know relatively uh, a smooth ride for a a uh, a star to get a to get a memoir in, on the shelf, right? Um, mm -hmm. It's just a name recognition, whether the memoir is good or is total not good. Um, and I've read both from you know recognizable stars. Mm -hmm. But if you're not a recognizable star, you're an average Joe or Jane writing mm -hmm. a memoir mm -hmm. um, and the world doesn't know about you. What is the best advice you can give to somebody in that situation on how to break into or through that sort of publishing barrier of saying, okay, yeah, you, you know, who, who are you? Well, you know, here's my memoir. Well, you know, you don't have a name. So we're not, you know, how, how do you go about that? Well, um, one thing that has been very popular in memoirs is sort of abuse and dysfunctional family stories. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. It's yeah, it is a shame. I, I, I think that to write a good, I think that memoir is storytelling. I think you have to be a damn good storyteller and you have to give me a reason to care about you. I've never heard about you. I don't know who you are. You have to make me care about you. And, you know, I read so many books out that start, I this, I that, I blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I don't care. I don't care about you. Just because it's important to you doesn't mean it's important to me. You know, make it important to me through good storytelling. Draw me in, pull me in, right? I don't think anybody knew who Mary Carr was when she wrote The Liars Club, right? Probably not. And that's an amazing, I mean, she's a great storyteller. She's one of the best memoirists out there, right? I, I like Lorraine Carey's book, Black Ice. Lorraine Carey's a local author too. And she told a story of two years of her life where she was, got a scholarship to a very um, elite private school in New England. And she was the only black student there. And she talks about her experience. Never heard of Lorraine, when I first found this book, I never heard of her. It was just a really well-told, interesting story. That's what it needs to be. 
I, I think, I don't know if that's helpful, but, but that's what I think. I don't know. Yeah, I think, I think, well, anything is helpful, you know, I mean, uh, and I think, uh, I don't know if you would agree with this or not, but it seems like, you know, when you're writing a memoir and then you're, you need to sell yourself and in, in your story in a new, unique way to an agent who then needs to sell you and your story in a new, unique way to the publisher. Is that? Yeah. I mean, what's the, the book that um, it's the bestseller now? It's um, it, uh, right here. It's called Between Two Kingdoms by Sulika Jaquad. She was a journalist and she got diagnosed with cancer and she almost died. She went into remission and then she traveled across the country. It's a great story. It's just a great story, but it's, and it's beautiful writing. It has to be both those things. Have you ever come across uh, memoirs that are told um, in essays? It's a collection of essays. Yes. Yes. Who? I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to remember. Um, uh, Maggie O'Farrell. Um, hold on. Look okay. Up. Well, she does that, our own um, I found it. Gary Bueller did that. Mm -hmm. Maggie O'Farrell wrote Hamnet, which is, right? So this is her memoir, I Am, I Am, I Am, 17 Brushes with Death. Mm. Wow. Okay? And she talks about 17 near-death experiences. And, and through that, you're going to learn about her life. That's her lens. And also, Lori Hall Sanderson, who one of her most famous books is um, well, she, she wrote this book, Speak. It's a middle grade book about a high school girl who's raped and what happens. And it's a classic. It was published 20 years ago, but it was based on Lori's experience. And so 20 years later, she wrote a memoir, which she called Shout. And it's a memoir in verse. So I've mm -hmm. seen a few of those. Also, Jacqueline Woodson wrote a memoir in verse. So, and if I think of any others in um, essays, I'll... I'll let you know. All right, thank you. And what do you think about, there's a, a bookstore I've been to once in Harrisburg in the middle. Oh, yeah, and I've never been there. But I've we, heard just, about. we just happened to get there yeah. 10 minutes because, before, I think it was CNN was doing, uh, was um, yeah. filming a, a, an author a presentation to yeah. different authors. Um, and you stood up in the balcony. Is that the focus of that bookstore? Is I got the feeling that because the stage took up a good part of the bookstore, that that was the focus was presentations. I'm not sure. I, I, I'm really not. I, I've heard about it. I've seen pictures of it. I've never been there. Um, it is kind of a famous store, and we're both forgetting the name of it right now. Yes, but of course, cool yeah. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Books, for anyone who hasn't seen your original bookstore, it was a very interesting store because it was also connected to another store that you would walk past through, two other stores, I'm sorry, two other stores that you pass through. And so it wasn't normal, like you might find an association of things associated with a bookstore. This was completely different. It was like a gift shop and something else. I, I vaguely remember it, but it was a very cool experience to go in there um, because it all enhanced the experience of walking through there, right? And, and I'm bringing that up because for a long time, I guess bookstores have figured out that books are not the only thing that they can sell well. Barnes and Noble has games and toys and all sorts of things. What do you, can you give us an idea of what percentage of what you sell is actually books? And do you see that shrinking? Do you see that growing? Um, or anything else you would tell us about that other part of the experience? Does it help you sell books? And not that it has to, right? Because it's a business that exists. 
I mean, the books are the majority of our sales. I'm not sure what the exact percentage is. Um, I mean, lots of bookstores make a lot of money on other ancillary items. Um, for example, I remember once I went to visit Headhouse Books and I noticed that their greeting card spinners are in the front window. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that tells you something. Yeah. Um, so greeting cards are a big part of it. Barnes and Noble did make a pretty big commitment to toys and games, and then they pulled back on it because they felt it was muddling their message. Okay. Some Barnes and Noble stores have music, um, but I think they're going right. to pull back on that as well. Um, so, and then there are stores that are like other things and they have books, like a little store I went to that was a cafe and a music venue that also sold books. But I think the books get lost in that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, it looks like people are departing. I have a question, though. I have a question. Sure. Um, when, when you're at when you had open book and also Barnes and Noble, do you ever get authors or writers who who try to I think it's like guerrilla action with their own books, like try to um, put them in a good position, a position that I'd say were more more ready to sell, or I, I've heard of people actually going into bookstores and with that, without even selling their books there, just putting putting their books in there. I haven't done it. Uh, or else like putting their own- Not just finding them for sale in that store and kind of moving them and making them more visible. I you... did that myself. I, I, my, my first book was a saddle stitch. So it didn't look good in, in a shelf. So I would That's take fine. it and turn it. Right. So uh, I find... hadn't heard about that. No, no. What I find is that people cover up books that they don't agree with the political opinions. Mm. But I mean, authors themselves, though, do, do ever, your authors already come in there and try to put their book in a different position? Eye level? No, I haven't had that experience so no? much. No. Mm -mm. Cool. Yeah. People are pretty respectful of that. A Sounds like a Vince story, though. <laughs> <laughs> I had to do it. I, if you've never heard of Marlow Books in the Northeast, uh, Marlow in the Roosevelt, Roosevelt Mall, Greed Abroad. Oh, okay. No. no. I sold I sold a whole lot of 9,000 books there. I, wow. And I was, I was just lucky. Yeah. Was, uh, hold on. Oops. It was this one. And it was no, a, a saddle, saddle stick. Right. Lofty sampler, a nice. photograph past and present. And me and my brother did it. And how much, what's the, what's the cover price on that? Uh, this was like four ninety five. This is back in uh, 1983. Okay, it's pretty. Yeah. But, uh, and so we would go into different bookstores. We were in a lot of Bal B. Dalton's, a lot of them. And uh, we would go in there and, and if they were in the shelf like this, we would just turn them. That people do all the time. That's fine. Yeah. I'm just going to put it back where I want it after you. <laughs> well, we still sold them. And I'm going to take that whatever you put on top of Michelle Obama's face and put it away too. <laughs> well, folks, thank you very much. Lynn, I can't thank you enough. Um, we, we get a lot of presenters, but mostly it's authors who come to share their journey with us and something special about what they did when I'm, when I'm talking to them ahead of time that there's something special about their story. I say, this is what we should highlight, right? But rarely do we get anyone from a bookstore. We've had a couple of publishers that we've been lucky. We've had one agent and now we have you, which really gives us a whole different perspective on everything, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think we all intuitively know that Amazon's your enemy, right? <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and we realize that. And we realize that we're doing ourselves a disservice when we buy all our stuff from there we're putting out a business the other places that we want to go to browse mm -hmm. that we have the physical experience at right that we we're need not going to get mm -hmm. yeah we i i i mean i don't want to go too far on this but i i do think their goal is to put other businesses out of business i mean i think that's their explicit goal yeah my part of what i heard was their goal is to be in the middle of every transaction so they don't care if they stock it. That's a bonus for them. Right. But they want to sell it through them. Right. Right. Because they're I'm, I'm doing stuff. okay not shopping from them. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I'm not shopping from big box stores. I spend right. a lot of money at Target 
Best Buy, but mm -hmm. I'm that's one of the reasons that I buy from Barnes and Noble is, is, is specifically me thinking about supporting you guys as opposed to Amazon. Also, because, uh, in the Valley Forge of Barnes and Noble, which is the one that I go to, uh, you can pick up, you can order, you can get the order in, and it'll you can drive over and pick it up, or you can. Uh, uh, at, the, at the worst case, uh, ship for them, you know? Well, we'll tell Lisa and everybody there that I say hi. <laughs> Great. Well, I'm going to make sure that I've, 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 I know all these people by sight, but I've never made the connection with that I should go up and actually talk to them. Lisa's the manager you... with the super curly blonde hair. Okay. And the friend well, I'll make a point of it now. It, it's uh, they're part of my network. So <laughs> learning. So Lynn's given up her evening to share her knowledge and experience with us, which is a great gift for all of us. Yes. Right? So Lynn, mm -hmm. thank you so, so much for that. You're welcome. Um, you I know, certainly to... go in, buy from Barnes and Noble, buy from Lynn and, and get her recommendation on that book. She's going to try and sell you the, the thing that you didn't come in for. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I appreciate if you shop at Barnes and Noble, but I would just say buy from a brick and mortar store. Okay. I don't care which one it is. Just mm -hmm. buy from a bricks and mortar store. And if there's an indie in your neighborhood, shop there. They need you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Sort of consider Barnes and Noble. I used to think of Barnes and Noble as the big box, you know, yeah. putting everybody out. So I would go to the independent. Yeah. But now in hearing rumors for, you know, a year or more about Barnes and Noble going out yeah. of business, I, I take turns. Yeah. And I consider Barnes and Noble, especially my little one in Broomall, um, I really want it to stay. It's the only one in yeah. our area. We I, get that a lot. People come in and say, I, I, you know, it's cheaper on Amazon, but I wanted to shop here because I don't want you guys to go out of business. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. I'm grateful for that. I don't want us to go out of business here. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's all right. Like thank you all. I had so much fun talking to you. Good luck. If you think of questions afterwards, um, I know, Gary, you can forward them to okay. me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you Anyone who wants to play, I'll... I'll